The first item of business is general questions, and at question number one, I call Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on whether it anticipates meeting its target to have over 50 per cent of buses running on hydrogen or electric by the end of 2023. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government has set a high bar on the decarbonisation of Scotland's bus fleet. As a consequence, the proportion of zero emission buses in Scotland is now three times higher than that of in other parts of the UK. We have invested £113 million to date, supporting 548 zero-emission buses and associated infrastructure. I know that SME operators face additional challenges, and the Minister for Transport launched the Market Transition Scheme on 10 August, specifically to support them to prepare for the next round of capital funding, which will be launched in the spring next year. Brian Whittle. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. But despite bold promises from the Scottish Government, the reality of delivering a zero carbon public transport system by the end of next year looks set to fall well short. I think earlier this week the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Net Zero Energy and Transport described hydrogen as Scotland's greatest industrial opportunity since oil and gas, which I absolutely agree with. But despite this, I can count the number of hydrogen refuelling stations in Scotland today on one hand. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the Scottish Government must support investment in hydrogen refuelling infrastructure now to give bus operators and transport operators more widely the confidence to commit to hydrogen as a fuel source and support the growth of new hydrogen industry in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member may be aware that the, I think it's the largest uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, bus fleet in Europe is operating at the present moment in Aberdeen as a result of funding support that came from the Scottish uh, Government. But in terms of the potential for hydrogen investment in the future, I agree with them. Um, hydrogen refuelling is a key part of helping to give the industry confidence in the growth of uh, technology. However, the way in which the uh, bus decarbonisation funding operates is it is agnostic on the technology, and the vast majority of bus operators have chosen to invest in uh, electric battery uh, buses, uh, many of which, fortunately, are built in my own constituency at the fantastic factory at Alexander Dennis's, who are world leaders in battery electric technology as well. And we want to make sure that we see them using battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell, if that's what they choose to do, and to make sure there is the right fueling infrastructure to support them, should they choose to go into hydrogen. Jackie Dunbar. Thank you. I am aware of the difference the Scottish Government's investment is making in my constituents with Aberdeen benefiting from exciting new hydrogen vehicles. The SNP has huge ambition to decarbonise buses as part of our commitment to our net zero journey, and the UK Government seems, through its actions and rhetoric, to be committed to a war on nature and a race to the bottom on environmental standards. How does the Scottish Government's approach differ from what is happening elsewhere in the UK? Um, on the substantive question, please, Cabinet Secretary. Well, President, officer, uh, the Scottish Government is uh, investing in uh, the members' constituency uh, and other towns and cities across the country in helping to decarbonise the bus fleet. Aberdeen has benefited from Scottish Government funding to the tune of some £12.7 million, which has supported 37 battery electric buses and some £7.5 million to support 25 hydrogen fuel cell buses, uh, which is in addition to uh, the decarbonisation transport hydrogen bus help support that we have also uh, provided through the Scottish Emerging Hydrogen Economy uh, programme. Uh, I can also assure the member that we will continue to help to support our bus sector to decarbonise and to do so in a way that helps to not only improve connectivity but also helps to ensure uh, that it supports Indigenous Scottish businesses that are world leaders in developing decarbonised bus fleets. Question two was not lodged. Question three, Maurice Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it can provide an update on the progress that has been made on a deposit return scheme. Minister Lorna Slater. Scotland's deposit return scheme will begin on the 16th of August 2023. Good progress has been made in recent months, and this includes the scheme administrator signing contracts for its logistical and IT services, the start of construction of the sorting centres, and significant financial investment being made by the service providers and retailers, as well as the £18 million loan funding from the Scottish National Investment Bank and the Bank of Scotland. 
With just under one year to go until the scheme goes live, businesses are preparing for launch, and we are working closely with the scheme administrator, Circularity Scotland, to ensure that they are ready. Morris Golden. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister and I both want deposit return to succeed, but industry are worried it's turning into a car crash. Their concerns are mounting. The huge costs of the scheme, labelling and point of sale not clarified, an online take-back system that's impossible to, live, to deliver as planned, complete lack of information on collection services, a risk of dealing with broken glass, product lines being withdrawn, and an utter lack of central guidance from either the Scottish Government or the secretive company they created. Will the Minister publish the latest gateway review from May and accept that action must be taken before it's too late? Minister. I thank the member for the question and, as always, for his interest in the success of this scheme. We are now at the stage that we're looking at the operational details of the scheme and are engaging very closely with industry, stakeholders, SEPA, local authorities and Circularity Scotland. We are at the stage of working out exactly those details that the member asks about. The legislation as passed by this Parliament is quite broad, meaning that industry has the opportunity to adapt the scheme to its specific needs. Of course, this is the stage that we're at, that we're making the scheme work for industry and we're doing this very closely. I am very confident that the scheme will be a success and will launch next August 16th. Question number four, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what resources are available to protect important equipment within the health sector in the event of incidents such as fire or floods. Cabinet Secretary Humza Yousaf. I can thank uh, James Dornan on, uh, for his question. All NHS boards have developed fire risk assessments and flood risk assessments of NHS sites to help manage and mitigate the risks of fire and flooding. The assessments using the guidance are required in all hospitals and indeed in all other NHS buildings from which healthcare services are provided. As part of the wider programme of work to understand the risks of climate change, climate change impact assessments and flood risk assessments have been prepared by NHS Scotland Assure for each health board to identify current and importantly future climate risks, including flooding to equipment and services. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. But does he agree with me that we should be investigating all angles to protect the environment? And is he aware of the good work being done in the field of protection of goods and equipment, such as used in hospitals? In case of floods, by a, in case of floods by a scientist working with Glasgow University and Strathclyde University, and the one such product was launched at COP26, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to investigate this further to see if there are any more potential solutions in Scotland that we are yet unaware of? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, yes, I will uh, happily uh, investigate that. I am, I am aware of the technology he is referring to. In fact, my colleagues uh, Ivan McKee and I know in her constituency capacity, Co-Cab Stewart, I think went to uh, see the uh, autonomous uh, uh, flood uh, tent uh, developed by uh, Mr Mohammed uh, Iftikhar in his role uh, in Glasgow uh, University. So, yes, absolutely aware of it. Uh, of course, uh, Mr Dornan is welcome to provide me with further detail. And of course, we would uh, pass that on to the, through the appropriate channels to our NHS National Procurement Service. Question number five, Michael Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether independent fiscal forecasts should be published alongside significant fiscal policy events. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, following the devolution of tax and social security powers to Scotland, the Scottish Government set up the Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission which has provided credible independent forecasts to Parliament and the Scottish Government since 2017. The Scottish Fiscal Commission Act requires the Commission to produce at least two forecasts each financial year, containing its five-year forecasts of the economy, demand-led Social Security benefits and receipts from devolved taxes, non-domestic rates, income tax attributable to Scottish, Scottish rate resolution and assigned VAT receipts. The Scottish Government will always respect the role of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and our budgets will always be accompanied by their independent forecasts. Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for that answer. Last month, the Tory government's refusal to publish fiscal project projections led to a collapse in our currency and economic misery that will endure for years to come. Last week, SNP MPs voted for those fiscal projections to be published immediately. Yet, and, President Officer, I find this scarcely believable, this SNP government is refusing to publish their own fiscal projections to accompany their own economic policy. 
President Officer, can it really be true the Scottish Government will provide no fiscal framework prior to their proposed referendum? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm glad Mr Mara has got some really good reading material. It might help change his mind about a few things and improve his views about certain questions. It's really, it's, it's really, it's really important that Mr, Mr Mara essentially answered his own question uh, in the way he put it to me. The fiscal chaos created by the United Kingdom Government is hardly the backdrop to make a dispassionate assessment of the condition of Scotland's public finances because of the mess that the UK Government has created. As Mr Mara knows, this Government believes in fiscal responsibility and we stand on our record for fiscal responsibility. We have delivered fiscal responsibility and we will continue to do so. Willie Rennie. Uh, the Deputy First Minister is doing his usual huffing and puffing, I suspect because he has been caught following Liz Truss's rule book on fiscal probity. Isn't it time to be honest about the damaging impact of his plans for an independent currency for Scotland and publish an independent fiscal forecast for his dangerous plans for this country? Cabinet Secretary. I, uh, I have everything to learn about huffing and puffing from Mr Rennie. And I promise, I promise to be a faithful student of the art of huffing and puffing from Mr Rennie. And no doubt, and no doubt uh, also from the other oracle of huffing and puffing, Jackie Bailey, on the front benches here as well. The, uh, when, when, it comes to, when, it comes to, when it comes to political honesty, I think Mr Rennie should be honest about the damage that he and his colleagues inflicted on this country by propping up the Conservatives in 2010 and creating the agenda of austerity that has delivered such misery for the people of this country. Question number six, Stephen Kerr. Can I have him puff to ask the Scottish Government what consideration it is given in its planning policy to the role of mixed energy generation methods. Minister Tom Arthur. Our draft national planning framework for set out how planning and development will support our net zero ambitions by 2045. It proposed clear support for all forms of renewable energy and low carbon fuel technologies, including transmission and distribution infrastructure and energy storage. We have been giving very careful consideration to the outcomes from the public consultation and the Scottish parliamentary scrutiny of draft NPF4, and I will lay a revised version in the Parliament for approval shortly. We have been pleased with the broad support for the general direction of travel we proposed in the draft NPF4. Stephen Kerr. But the most recent Climate Change Committee report to the UK Parliament makes it clear that nuclear and particularly advanced modular nuclear reactors must be part of an energy mix as a high priority to deliver energy security. That's from the Climate Change Committee. So what is it that the Scottish Government knows that the Climate Change Committee does not, that it allows it to maintain its stance that nuclear is superfluous to Scotland's energy future? Minister. Well, from that mitted applause from the Conservative benches, it seems like uh, Mr Kerr is a majority of one with that particular view. The Scottish Government is very clear on regards to its policy that we do not support new fission nuclear power stations. And as regards um, small modular nuclear reactor, they are very much still at the design and licensing stage. And as such, their economic competitiveness remains unproven. Stephanie Callaghan. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will include initiatives to respond to a range of barriers that are currently acting as a disincentive to planning for further solar deployment, and will the new energy strategy include targets to grow Scotland's solar generation capacity, which is currently around 3 per cent of the UK total? Minister. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of energy generated from solar in contributing to the decarbonisation of Scotland's energy supply and helping us meet our targets for a net zero emission society by 2045. In support of this, we will consult on a solar vision for Scotland as part of the draft energy strategy and just transition plan. This vision will consider the key barriers to enabling greater development of solar, 
and set out the commitments the Scottish Government will take in order to reduce these barriers and encourage greater solar deployment in Scotland. I am also pleased to confirm that we are also bringing forward our consideration of permitted development rights for domestic and non-domestic renewable energy equipment, including non-domestic solar panels. We intend to consult on this early in 2023, and I hope this is something that will be welcomed across the Chamber. Question number seven, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what the implications will be for its budget of recent changes in the UK Government's fiscal policy. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Mr. So the United Kingdom Government did not engage the Scottish Government on the most recent changes in fiscal policy for our budget, and we face the prospect of further reductions as the United Kingdom Government tries to manage the damage that was caused by the Conservative mini budget um, uh, some weeks ago. Uh, indeed, the Chancellor himself has warned about decisions of eye-watering difficulty. Uh, I've just completed a call with the new Chief Secretary to the Treasury, who has assured me there will be dialogue with the Scottish Government in advance of the autumn statement, and I welcome that assurance. With inflation eroding the real terms value of our budget by £1.7 billion since it was introduced in December, the United Kingdom Government needs to use the autumn statement on the 17th of November to set out how it will protect public services, households and businesses from inflation and the cost crisis and rule out a return to austerity. Colin Beattie. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his response. The U-turns made by the UK Government have caused great uncertainty for many Scots, with mortgage pro products being pulled and the pound crashing. And this is only made worse by the UK Government's unwelcome delay to its budgetary plans announced by the Chancellor this week. People need certainty and stability. Will the, will the Deputy First Minister agree with me that the only way we can provide certainty for Scotland's economic future is through the full powers of independence? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I, I agree with Mr Beattie on the central premise of his question. One of the key points that was made in the 2014 referendum campaign by those who argued for the Union was it offered fiscal certainty. And any independent observer looking at the events of the last few, not just weeks, but years, would understand the fiscal and economic damage that has been done as a consequence of our continued participation in the United Kingdom. Whether that is the economic effects of Brexit, which everybody knows is having a negative effect on economic performance and on migration, or whether it is the mind-numbingly damaging decisions that were taken in the mini-budget that will create economic hardship for people in this country who will lose homes and jobs as a consequence of the unnecessary increases in interest rates. So Mr Beattie makes a very strong argument. I am delighted to associate myself with his arguments and to make sure that argument is put to the people of our country. Question number eight, Ross Greer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the People's Plan for Action published earlier this month by the Scottish Trade Union Congress, Poverty Alliance, Living Rent and a number of other groups. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The cost of living crisis is the most immediate challenge to people and businesses across Scotland and I am keen that we work together to do what we can to support those who need it most. We are already providing significant support for households to mitigate the impacts of the cost crisis. By the end of March 2023, we will have invested almost £3 billion in a range of measures for households, supporting energy bills, childcare, health and travel, as well as social security payments that are either not available elsewhere in the UK or are more generous here. We are making hard choices to prioritise spending, redirect resources and find savings so that we can provide support and reduce burdens where we can. Ross Greer. Thank you. I welcome that answer from the Cabinet Secretary. Enforcing fair work practices is one of the campaign's nine key asks. Requiring all those seeking public sector grants to pay at least the real living wage would be an example of this kind of enforcement and is a commitment made in the Butte House Agreement between the Scottish Greens and Scottish Government. Could the Cabinet Secretary therefore confirm the Scottish Government intends to implement this conditionality as soon as possible? Cabinet Secretary. So we remain fully committed to strengthening our approach to conditionality, including payment of the real living wage uh, in channels for effective voice. It's clear that fair work, including fair pay, is more important than ever in the cost of living crisis, and we will use all the levers we can to support those most affected. As committed to in the Butte House Agreement, we will introduce a requirement on public sector grants to pay at least a living wage to all employees and provide appropriate channels for effective voice subject 
to limits on devolved competence, and ministers will confirm the detail of the conditionality on public sector grants in the coming weeks.